You're an associate professor of systematic theology at Reformed Theological Seminary, Charlotte campus. You know and you speak at a lot of different seminaries. Uh, strengths as far as that world goes in missions, things that you see in 2021, dating this a little bit, but mm -hmm. from what you see in that world and things that you say, man, we could grow in this in relation to missions. Because I, I hear a lot from seminary students and I'm not part of that world, but man, that you're a big part of that world. What are the things you see, you're seeing in there? Yeah, so some really encouraging things. Mm. Uh, I think we, we're getting great students. I feel like I have great students who are eager to, to learn. They're hungry. They, they want to know the Bible, know theology. They want to serve. Um, and actually, some of the things we've been talking about, I'm encouraged that I find a lot of, uh, in the seminary world, I think there is a lot of emphasis on the local church. Mm. And I think people are really putting a focus on that, that that's important. And I think there's a lot of good things going on. And I'm just speaking in kind of the world that I know yeah. uh, from RTS and Westminster and uh, Southern and other good seminaries. Mm. Uh, you know, I think you're seeing good confessional evangelical reform guys who are who are leaders, you know, academically, who mm. are, you know, editing important books, who are contributing to the field, who are who are really doing good theological yeah. and, and biblical exegetical work. So anyone who knows English has such an embarrassment of virtue. I mean, oh. it's unbelievable. Never in the history. Never in the history has there been anything yeah. like this. And from your phone, you know, there you go. Yep. Or you bring it into where you're traveling. But so that's a strength, it's particularly to missions. I think there's a lot of good, uh, you know, at least in my neck of the woods, I think there's good careful thought on getting yeah. this, this mission of the church stuff right. Here, I, th I think, are two maybe weaknesses. Mm. Uh, one is uh, it's easy to say what mission is. It's harder to say what mission isn't. Hmm. And I, I just want to make sure that when we tell people what, you know, church planning, evangelism, we're, we're also saying some of the hard things. And I say this when I train pastors. The hardest thing you'll do as a pastor is you're, you have to say no all the time. Hmm. And one of the hardest things you'll say no to are really good people who want to do good things under the name of missions. Yeah. And you they love Jesus and they're doing great things and they want to they want to redeem Hollywood and they want to make Christian movies or they want to do okay, that's, but is that our mission budget, mm. you know? So I think students need greater clarity on that. I think seminaries need to help provide that. One of the things I sometimes give people is I say if if Oprah or Bono, those are maybe dated, I don't know who the the, the, the voices are now, but if Oprah right. or Bono would be doing it, yeah. then maybe that's not what the church should be doing. Yeah. Uh, if there are non-Christians who are doing that, praise the Lord. But mm. when it comes to the church as the church, let's be doing the things that no one else is going to be doing. So a carefulness about a what carefulness. you attach to. Yeah, and what, what? What, that's right. And then I would say, uh, I think the you know seminaries need to continue to grow in putting missions front and center while they're doing it. So it mm. can often be an afterthought. Yeah, yeah, you probably got to take one missions class. Yeah. Uh, I went to Gordon-Conwell, which, um, you know, I, I think I send people to RTS, I think is better in a lot of ways. Uh, but one of the things I did appreciate about Gordon-Conwell is there was a real emphasis on mm. missions. And there was a lot of people there training for missionaries. We had you know, prayer times during the day to pray for unreached people groups. There's just a real emphasis, and I think it uh, that sort of mission-oriented piety would be really healthy yeah. on our seminary campuses. And I and I'm not sure that it's always there or that it's cultivated as we might be able to. Yeah, no, it's helpful. Mm. Why should aspiring missionaries look at ecclesiology, the area of the doctrine of the church? Why should that be kind of a a cornerstone for aspiring missionaries? Yeah, not only should it be a cornerstone, I think it's it's very often sadly overlooked. And, uh, you know, all, all praise and honor to missionaries faithfully sharing the gospel and doing discipleship, but it can often happen that they're meeting with people, sharing the gospel, trying to teach them about the word, and you ask them, what about the church? And it's not even an afterthought, it's sometimes not a thought. So... Uh, 
I say, although I don't know if this is original to me, probably not, that the church is the origin and the aim of missions. Amen. So it starts out of the church. We have, you know, we're going to talk about Radius. It's a great training organization. There are sending agencies. So there's different layers, and, and they all play a role. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yet it comes out of the church. We want local churches to be not just invested, but vetting people, yeah. sending people out. So it's the origin of missions, and it's also the aim of mission. And you see this in Acts 14 very clearly, where Paul gives really the, the three-legged stool of what he's doing with missions, that he's not only evangelizing, he's not only discipling them in the Word, but it's in any appointed elders in every town. So he's establishing churches. Yep. So we need to not just be aiming for conversions, praise God, we want to see those, but to nurture those new believers into established churches. And so you ask the question why ecclesiology is important, because church is the aim. And if it's the aim, then we need to have some idea of what is a church. Mm. And I'm Presbyterian, you're wrong. No, I just answered, no, of course not. Uh, you're Baptist. Or Baptist. Yes, or Baptist. Um, you know, I'm an irregular Christian, as our friend Mark Dever would call me. So we have differences. Yeah. And uh, it's not that every one of those differences has to be figured out before you go to the, the mission field. But, you know, we would agree and, uh, our, you know, we mentioned Mark and so a lot of other people would agree who are doing great work in ecclesiology, mm -hmm. just how important it is that Church is not simply plural for Christian. Amen. That's what people think sometimes. Yeah. And they go to, well, two or three are gathered. Well, that's really a verse about church discipline, that Jesus is in the midst of them and whatever you do it and yeah. agree in my name. So it's not, hey, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, we're on a park bench, yeah. and I guess if we open our Bible and sing, we have a church. Yeah. There, there are certain elements constitutive of church that there's... Uh, preaching and prayer and there's officers and there's some kind of order mm. of discipline and there's there's an inside and an outside we see that implied in first corinthians 15 that if you're going to have people outside the church and there must be some sort of mechanism we might call it membership that you yeah. become inside the church all of these things are really important and we see them in the bible they're not Western constructs that we're in looking to impose upon other people. Certainly we have things as Westerners we want to make sure we set aside and, and hold loosely. But ecclesiology, biblical ecclesiology, is one of those essentials. Yeah. Okay, explain this to me. I'm a high school kid. I'm hearing somebody read to me Matthew 28, 16 through 20, and they're saying, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. I don't hear church in there. I'm assuming that this is all about just going and making disciples. How are you getting to church from that text, or what, what are you banking that on if the Great Commission doesn't say anything about church? Because mm -hmm. I've heard some fairly popular speakers say, God didn't call us to plant churches, he called us to make disciples. What would your response be to kind of that thought? Right. Well, of course, you have, Jesus is the first person who's talking about the church right. in earlier in Matthew chapter 18. So Jesus is talking about something that exists in some Jewish sense, and you know, ecclesia is, is, is a broader term of assembly. But church, as it becomes developed, isn't yet there. So sure. it makes sense that Jesus is not going to talk about church as it doesn't quite yet exist, as right. we're going to find in the Pauline letters and establishing officers. But even just take... So that's one reason. We don't want to be anachronistic. But... More importantly, perhaps, when you take the totality of what Jesus is saying, it, it presumes something like a church because it doesn't say go and make conversions. It says make disciples and, not just that, but you are baptizing them. And what is baptism? You know, Presbyterians and Baptists, we disagree about who is the subject for baptism, mm. but we both agree it's a sacrament or an ordinance of inclusion, just like circumcision marked you out as in, being included in this family, in this right. group, so baptism does, and I think all Baptists agree with that. Well, if it is, what, what are you being included in? You're being named with the triune name. You're being folded in 
to this community, into something. Mm, yep. And so that presupposes the existence of a church. Baptism is not, you know, even depending on our you know, view on the sacraments, it's not merely certainly just you know, a testimony of either the parents' faith or your faith. It's a naming ordinance that places you into a broader and into a community. So I, I actually think you see, going back to Acts 14, Paul's three-legged stool of his missionary work, which we yeah. see all throughout the book of Acts, actually gets reflected into the Great Commission that you have uh, a, a going, and so you know, sort of frontier evangelism, we might call it, but then also a discipleship, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded, and then baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So you have the evangelism, the discipleship, and the church planting. Yeah. And you know, just what I said, if you, if you want to look at you know, the, the Great Commission and Luke and Acts are organically connected because it's the same author, that we're meant to go to the book of Acts to say, okay, now Jesus gave this to his disciples. And it's first of all for his disciples. Right. It's by extension for us, but it's by his disciples. So even there, it finds us locus in this fledgling church, which is there in this apostolic team. But if you want to show what does this look like, how does it actually unfold, go to the book of Acts, and it's, it's involving churches and the establishment of elders and going back to train up these churches. It's not simply throw a, a bed sheet up you know, between two trees and show a movie and get a show of hands whether people come to know Jesus and then we move on. We need yeah. to plant churches. Okay. No, that's helpful. There's a certain school of thought in missions today that, okay, you're a church guy. Like you, because you like the church, you can't help but impose mm -hmm. your Western viewpoint. You're obviously into pews and stained glass windows. <laughs> and that, when you speak of church, that's just part and parcel to who you are. And like, you're going to pray with your hands like this, and you're not, you're going to do yeah. certain things that are just, these are the things that you're exporting, whether you know it or not, overseas when you talk about church. The guys who are able to overcome their Western encumbrances are going to think of church in a much more broad way. They're not going to have these stringent categories that you impose because that's Western. Thoughts on that? Is the church Western as a concept? Is that something that we're pulling from our background, being from Matthews, North Carolina, mm. or Lansing, Michigan? Is that just give me a little bit of thought on that? Like, is are we airing there? Well, of course, there's an element of truth, but the argument on a whole can often be a sort of straw man. So, yes, it's, it's true that all of us inhabit a culture, uh, and we're shaped by that culture. We have certain assumptions from that culture, and those can be good, bad, or neutral. Now, it's, it's, a, it's a bit ironic to me that people are so quick to say, Christianity and church is just Western. Well, we do worship a, a Middle Eastern Jewish man. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, the early church center was there around the Mediterranean basin in, in North Africa. And later, because of the spread of Islam, really, is why it became situated in Western Europe and mm. from there now. And it's far from a Western religion. I mean, it's the, the, the average Christian today, as you know, is... Southern, not meaning North Carolina, but Southern in terms of the global church. So yes, we want to be mindful of it, but really, I, I roll my eyes a little bit because, I don't know, are there still missionaries who are going? And the first thing is, you need to believe in Jesus. Second thing, can we wheel the pipe organ in? Right. Are, do we have the pipe <laughs> organ set up and uh, we need to have the clerical robes. Well, if you want the robes or you don't want the robes, or if you want stained glass or you don't want stained glass, I just don't find that many, I mean, the missionaries that I talk to are doing that sort of crass, we import all of our right. Western trappings. So if we can agree, yes, you're going to use some different instruments, and there may be some different styles of preaching, and the buildings are going to look different. Right. Okay. But does that mean that these theological concepts are Western? Does it mean that if, uh, you know, again, because of where the church was situated for, you know, 1,500 years, mm. 
Yeah, it, it, if you want Christianity that's historic, you're going to read some dead Western people. <laughs> you just are. So the question is really, as much as we can, do we go back to the Bible and we say, let's test this. So that doesn't, that doesn't mean, you know, I say sometimes, just because we have blind spots doesn't mean we're blind about everything. Yeah. And so we can say, show me, I'm open. If, if, if there's something from the scriptures that, you know, shows that what we're doing here really doesn't belong to the Bible, but just belongs to my assumptions as mm-hmm. an American or as a Westerner, you know, for sure. But to think somehow that one theological precision is just a Western, that's, that's kind of a prejudice thing to okay. say. Uh, other people in the world don't care about those things. Or that the Bible itself, before you know, it had ever, you know, was centuries away from ever being spoken with an English tongue, that these concepts of church and elders and deacons and discipline and membership and order. Mm. I mean, Paul from the very beginning is dealing with local church kinds of issues. Yeah. How do you care for people? So, uh, it, it, yeah, of course there's some, you know, can be silly examples of Western things that get imported, but a whole lot of what we're talking about, hopefully, is really just good biblical ecclesiology. Amen. 2018, you wrote an article titled, What is my calling, and is that even a good question? And you went through six passages that explicitly mentioned calling in the New Testament, but you made the argument that none of them have to do with a specific calling. So we hear a lot about this idea of a missionary call. Kind of take your article, and how would you apply that to somebody that's looking for the missionary call? You don't need a missionary call. (laughs) Was that short enough? <laughs> yeah, that's really okay, short. Okay. It's very punchy. All right. Uh, I'll expo- explain that a little bit. So if we mean by calling, how do I know that the vocation I'm choosing for my life yeah. seems wise and prudent and I have the requisite gifts and abilities for it? Then mm-hmm. I'm all for the language of calling. And sometimes that's just what people yeah. people mean. Are you called to be a pastor? Are you called to be a missionary? Okay, you, you got the three, you know, tests. You know, do you have the gifts? Do you have the experience? Do you have, does the church affirm these things for you? Uh, so if that, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be the language police about using the word calling. Here's my concern, however, is that we can talk as if God sort of just, Normally, people go do a job, but there's two things in this world that he picks up the bat phone in particular, pastors and missionaries, Mm. and they get uh, absolutely the burning in their bosom to tell them that they need to do it. Now, I have many good friends, Presbyterian pastors, who disagree with me on this, and they they think I underemphasize calling, and I'm, I'm all about... A subjective sense of I should do this. But mm. the danger is twofold. One, you have the subjective sense and you really shouldn't be doing it because you don't have the gifts, you don't have the maturity, your church has not recognized in this year. Mm-hmm. You just have a feeling that I, I heard a great song on the radio or I went to an amazing conference, now I'm ready to get on a plane and go drop me in the jungle, I'm going to be a missionary. Hold on a second. Uh, you're not ready to do this. You are not have not been recognized by a church as having the maturity and gifts to do it. So that's one danger: is that people go who shouldn't go. Yeah. The other danger is people don't go who maybe should go mm. because whatever. There we all have a different emotional bandwidth. I mean, yeah. we know some friends who they get you know they get called to what restaurant they're going to go to. I mean, everything they're called to. Right. And then there are Dutch people. We don't, we don't, we don't have, we have a feeling. I don't know what it is, but, you know, so you have a different emotional bandwidth and there may be people who feel like, ah, yeah, you know, my, my pastor says I'd be good at this. I'm good with languages. I love the lost. Um, my, my family supportive. I, I, I want to go and do this and I'm trained, but I don't know. I don't have mm. that missionary call that I think I'm supposed to have. And so right. I don't go. Mm. So we don't want to discount the desire. There ought to be a desire to do it. We're not twisting people's arms. And yeah. yet that subjective sense by itself can be very misleading. Yeah. 
first time here on Radius Campus. Uh, we are on the campus, though nobody can tell from this shot. Mm -hmm. uh, thoughts? This is, you've 24 hours, gone on a couple runs with some students, <laughs> yeah. ate some tacos. Any thoughts on Radius? Well, I'm not saying this just because you're here and I'm in a, in a dark room <laughs> and I don't know my, my way out of the country. <laughs> uh, it's really, it's, it's really impressive and I'm really grateful. Obviously, we've known each other for a number of years and I've known people have come down and do this and talk about it, but it is one of those things. It's hard to kind of get in your head. What is this until you get here? Because mm. it's not a sending agency. Right. It's not a seminary. It is a training center to sort of fill the gap between some theological mm. education and then the, the place that's going to get you to the field. Um, I love, uh, you know, been here 24 hours, but the, the students take this in the best way. They're normal. They're no they, maybe you just sent me the normal ones. Right. But uh, there can sometimes be, a, well, let's just put it, you know, the, the, the missionaries are, they couldn't quite make it in their country. Mm. We'll send them to another country yeah. because other countries are nicer. Right. And they'll have to be nice to them. They'll fit into that weirdness yeah. over there. You don't have a good ministry here in your strange but you'll be great over there when you don't know the language. Right. So uh, that's been really good. I know earnest, as you would expect, but thoughtful, mm. kind. So the students have been great. And just see how really intentional, that's a key word, I would say. I mean, everything is really intentional here mm. at Radius. The schedule, the, the place where you're staying, the relationships, the training that you're getting. So I, I, it seems like a really good mix. You're in classes. Yeah. You're studying, there's academic, intellectual kind of work, especially around, but you're also learning about, I've had a lot of the, the students I've met talked about the uh, team dynamics class and how mm. good that's been to understand, okay, how do I get along with the team? Because everyone knows that's the main reason missionaries come back from the field because mm. they can't get along with their, their team. So not, not patting you on the, on the back. I know you give credit to a lot of other people and it's ultimately the Lord's work, but really seems like you guys have thought through what do we what do we need here nothing mm. extraneous mm. what what is going to help these people get there and when they get there if god will stay there for a long mm -hmm. time and uh yeah I, I think this is a great opportunity i encourage if pastors can come and see it or think about sending some of some of their people it's a great place nine months mm. to get Training. I just can't imagine that anybody would get this training and go to the field and not benefit from it. How would pastors benefit from Radius, from sending members here, uh, members that they are wanting to send to church plants among unreached people groups? How could pastors benefit from Radius? Where, where would you see the two kind of coming together and they would be aided by a program like this? I think Radius fills a gap that many pastors don't even know exists, mm. that we assume that somewhere between the church and maybe if they went to seminary or Bible college and the sending agency, which has their own training, we assume that all of the preparation they need to go out to the field has taken place. And maybe it is. There's lots of good people doing good work. But where I think Radius can really serve and is serving the local church and the local pastor is to say, what, what about some of the 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 special classes you need on phonetics or team dynamics, or how can we ensure not just that they've passed a personality test and had some rudimentary theology, but that they're really, really clear mm. on the church and on the mission of the church, and that they're well positioned to go and to stay. Because as much as short-term missions can be great, the Great Commission is not accomplished through short-term missions. Mm -hmm. It's accomplished through long-termers who go and stay for years and, and for decades. And I think Radius really can help with that. So uh, yes, it's uh, over the border. It's, it's not a cult. Uh, pastors, <laughs> you know, if they have the opportunity, you know, even I, I've just been here 24 hours. I think really you could drop in and, and spend a day and get a really good feel for yep. what it's like. Or, you know, if pastors can't do it, send, you know, the chairman of your missions committee or your missions pastor or, mm. or someone to go or your college, someone from the college ministry to go mm. and check it out and see because you'll you'll be grateful, you'll be encouraged, and then you'll you'll know ah this could be a really good thing for some of our graduates to go and do for nine months. Yeah. 
June of 2022, we are going to be holding the Radius Missiology Conference at Christ Covenant Church. I'm so glad. You're going to be there. Alistair Begg's going to be yeah. there. Ian Hamilton's going to be there. He's going to give a talk on John Payton that I am so looking forward to already. Uh, why would this be a good thing for pastors to attend? They, they hear about Radius. They can't make it down to see our campus down here. But there's this thing happening in Matthews, North, North Carolina. Yeah, you're going to get, uh, with those names, I don't know about me, but with everyone else, you're going to get good teaching uh, it's going to help you as a pastor mm. to know, understand missions better, to perhaps relearn some things. I, I know what I'm, I've been a pastor for 20 years. There's a lot of pressures on pastors, and it's easy for missions energy to dissipate mm. and to just set that up. That there's some there's going to be some committee that's all about that, and just don't make my life difficult. So right. it would be good for pastors just for their soul, mm. and then in particular to learn more about radius and understand is this is this an option mm. uh, because you don't have to be baptist you mean presbyterian it is going to be reformed soteriologically mm. and it's going to be careful ecclesiology uh, but i think pastors would really want to consider because hopefully you're sending out people do you want to consider this before maybe you use your own denomination sending agency or something else mm. to send them to radius and what better way than to have the conference come to you? Or if you're within the driving or short flying distance, come to Charlotte and have a great time. So glad. I'm so glad that you asked, and I'm honored that we can host it. Well, hey, thanks. We're looking forward to it. should be fun. You and I both appreciate, love, are participating in the Cross Conference, 18 to 25-year-olds. Great conference. We both think the world of it. If you're an 18 to 25 year old, you're sitting there, you're hearing Conrad and Bayway, you're hearing John Piper, you're hearing David Platt, they're speaking about the nations. How would you think through that? You're hearing these messages. What would you be praying if you were sitting there? What would you be thinking? What would you be looking for? Right. I, I think in addition to praying in that moment, which is obviously good, Lord, help me to know myself, hmm. help me to understand. I think we, we often pray, Lord, make me a, a clear sense of what I should do. Hmm. Lord, give me a clear sense of who you are and who I am. Hmm. That would probably be the starting place. Help me to understand your word correctly. Yeah. Help me to understand your heart for the nations. Help me to understand the need. Help me to understand who I am. And then even more than help me, Lord, in this moment to discern what I'm hearing, so often we just have baked in that this is very much an individual decision or between you and the Lord. Did you feel it? What are you doing? What are you thinking? Go back. It's one of the things I love about the cross conference is there's always a strong encouragement. Go back, talk to your pastor, talk to your, your campus leader, yeah. talk to a youth leader, talk to a trusted, mature Christian adult and, and tell them what you learned what you're feeling, what you're thinking, and especially if you're wondering, is this maybe something I want to do with my life? Yeah. Ask them about it. Hey, could you see me doing this? Now, you have to be careful. You may ask a parent who says, no way, you shouldn't go waste your life doing that. So you could get bad advice, but that's why you talk to a mature Christian leader who has a heart for the nations mm. and ask for some candid feedback. Do they see in you? And they may say yes, no, or hey, let's let's get some further training and see where this goes. Mm, excellent. Oh, that's really helpful. Uh, one of the things we recommend for aspiring cross-cultural missionaries, church planters, is to read good books. Give me just a quick hitter. Okay, let's do it in two categories. Number one, you're a high school student. You're thinking about going into missions. Your church leaders have said, yeah, we could see this being part of your future. We could see you doing this. What would be some books you would recommend? And then we're going to switch to the category of somebody who's already on that track. But for high school students. Yeah. Oh, there's so many things. Uh, you know, even more important than being a missionary is being a good Christian. Hmm. And you see this with Jesus when he sends out the, the 70 or the 72 and says, you know, don't rejoice that you saw Satan fall like lightning. Rejoice that your names are written in the book of life. Yeah. So it's more important to be a sheep than to be a shepherd. More important to be a found one than a seeker. Yeah. So, yeah, read, uh, and I think a high school student, read Knowing God. Read mm. a good Who's book. Who's that by? By J.I. Packer. Okay. So read a book that's going to help you understand who God is, yeah. understand his word, understand theological truth. Mm. Read, read 
The Holiness of God by R.C. Sproul. Mm. You know, read any of the books by R.C. Sproul would be a, a great place. Or, yeah, so that would be one. On the missionary side, so for a high school student, often God does stir up this call by stories of faithful mm. missionaries. And a, a great place is to read John Piper's you know, he's got all of those little biographical sketches. You can get the big book, The Swans Are Not Silent, or you can get the Filling Up Christ's Afflictions, where so you do add Nyland Judson and, yeah. and John Payton. Tyndale, Payton, Judson, yeah. yeah. You know, To the Golden Shore is mm. a classic missionary biography, and The Shadow of the Almighty from Elizabeth Elliot, mm. um, Amy Carmichael. So read, you know, pick up one or, or two and yeah. read a good biography, a good story. And, and, and let's be honest with it. We don't just want hagiography, the kind of biography that, you know, these missionaries were all humans yeah. and they were all sinners and yep. they all made mistakes, but they also had courage and also the Lord used them. So yeah, for a high school student, read those, get some good theology, understand who God is and talk a little bit and, and think a little bit more about what this mission. And then, uh, you know, get into whether it's Operation World or Joshua Project, and those resources have strengths and sometimes they have a few weaknesses, yep. but they're really, really invaluable mm -hmm. for just introducing you to the nations. True. And uh, okay, one other book: um, Let the Nations Be Glad. So read a good book. Chapter that, five. Chapter that, five is from John cool. Piper yeah. that gives the missionary heart of God for mm. the nations. No, it's good. It's a little bit more narrow scope. I'm a university student. I'm a seminary student. I'm about to graduate, possibly go to Radius, get trained, go to the field. What would be books that you would recommend? They're further along that path. They're committed. Their church elders have said, yes, we see this. You being sent out from our church, we see you've got the gifting. We see that, yeah, we, we agree with your maturity level. You're on that First Timothy 3, Titus 1 track. What would you recommend in those cases? So... Probably there, I'd want them to read some really good books on missiology that mm. are going to help sharpen how they view. So I'm, yeah. I'm assuming they got the inspiration and edification, and they got some theological parameters in place. So uh, Salvation to the Ends of the Earth is a biblical study of missions from O'Brien and Kostenberger. That, yeah. That's good. Uh, a name that I recommend often is, uh, it's a great name, Eckhard Schnabel. Yeah. Who he has Paul the missionary. Mm. He has two big books on Christian mission. He's he's maybe the world's foremost New Testament scholar and on mission stuff. And then if I can self footnote, I'll give all the credit to Greg Gilbert. But by Kevin DeYoung and Greg, Greg Gilbert, what is the mission of the church? There's also if you don't have time for that, um, a couple of guys did a book called uh, When Mission Is Everything. Yeah. Yeah, Denny Spitters, and who's the other guy? Uh, Ellison, I believe. Yeah, Craig yeah, and I. yeah. Good guys, and really just took some of those same things, and really trying to hit at this notion that yeah. says mission is everything in the world. No, let's be let's be thoughtful and, and a yeah. more narrow on what we mean by this. So I, I'd read some of those good missiology books. No, we really appreciate what is the mission of the church. We use that as a prerequisite down here. Um, evangelism and the sovereignty of God. Yeah. That's good. something mm -hmm. I've found mm -hmm. very helpful. For, J.I. Packer, also yeah. good. You know, Max Stiles stuff on evangelism is good. Yeah. Okay, a little bit more uh, interesting question, maybe. Uh, there's a T4G message by Mark Dever. And everybody that I've talked to in the Baptistic world, like, and I'll include myself in this, mm -hmm. I think it's his best message at any conference. Uh, it was this message called Endurance Needed, Strength for a Slow Reformation, and the Dangerous Allure of Speed. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I heard this, and it was like, this guy is saying everything mm -hmm. that I want to say from that type of a platform. And talking with you, you and I both like that message, mm -hmm. but how that message is interpreted primarily by Baptists and Presbyterians <laughs> tends to be somewhat different. Explain that to me. Why would Presbyterians hear that message and hear it differently, and Baptists would be, oh my goodness, I mean, this is hitting us right dead yeah. center. Yeah, sometimes we say as Presbyterians, we may be small, but we are slow. <laughs> so we, we, we get both of those things. Right. Strength upon strength. Y yeah. So I, the denomination I used to be a part of, yeah. which has, in many ways, a really rich missions history, 
some of the first people in the in the Arabian Peninsula, some of the first people in India, mm. and and yet, without wanting to, you know, throw all of those, you know, the whole legacy under the bus, yet I, I would encounter many people who would serve in foreign countries for a long time. I remember asking one man who was a missionary, and he his his mission was interfaith dialogue hmm. with Muslims. So he had a privileged place because they, they did a long mission there. Yeah. And uh, so I said, over the years, how many Christians have you seen, or how many Muslims have you seen become Christian? Yeah. And I get it, that's under the Lord's sovereignty, but I'm just curious. He said, right. no. I don't know that we actually ever saw any. Hmm. I said, how many Christians became Muslims? Oh, quite a few. Oh. So you're, you're working, that's not the missionary fruit yeah. you're looking for. Hmm. And, uh, you know, more evangelical, reformed and Presbyterian circles would not yeah. be, you know, quite in that same place. And yet, this gets to our strength and our weakness. There is, can be a tendency in Presbyterian missions to want to be very careful. They tend to send out people who are well-educated. We do education well, Presbyterians, and a lot with culture, contextual. But sometimes that means it takes a long time before you get around to telling somebody about Jesus. Hmm. So I loved Mark's message, and I knew where Mark was coming from with that. Yeah. But as we've talked about, and I think Mark agrees, that's not the danger everywhere. There, there are mission agencies or mission models that send you into places, and with a good desire to be incarnational, I don't really like that language, but I know what they mean, be yeah. incarnational, be among the people, build their trust. It's... It's not just I got to learn the language for a couple of years. It's five, ten years. I mean, and you're not sharing with anyone. Yeah. And you're not taking a risk, some boldness. Yeah, maybe you, maybe you, you do run afoul of some local authorities. But mm. That's that's why you're here. Or many times I've found under medical missions or other sorts of relief missions. Um, they call it missions, but it is really, we're here, and if someone wants to ask us why we're here, we'll tell them we love Jesus. Right. And that's about the extent of it. I say, brother or sister, go and sir, be a wonderful doctor. But, but if we're going to call it missions, right. you're leading people to the knowledge and relationship with Christ and helping to plant or you should churches. Be. Yeah. yeah. And you know, maybe your way to get in the country is to teach English or be a doctor or be an architect or whatever, but you're, why you're there in your heart is to do this. So the dangerous allure of speed, there are some places that are snail-like and need a little giddy-up. Right. On the Baptistic side of the equation, as an outsider, as a Presbyterian, uh, looking at the Baptists, why do you think this resonated so much with conservative Reformed Baptists and maybe like flesh out strengths and weaknesses yeah. as an outsider that right. you see from the Baptist camp. Here's the great strength. Baptists want to get people saved. Amen. <laughs> they want to get people saved. Right. Um, I remember when J.D. Greer wrote his book on Stop Asking Jesus Into Your Heart, and I, and I get that. That's not how I lead people to Christ. Right. And yet, coming from a more mainland denomination, part of me was like, Get Jesus into your heart. I'm, I'm happy for you if you want, right. you want Jesus. So I appreciate that Baptists are, they are so focused on the Great Commission. Hmm. And sometimes that's almost all Baptists. They agree on two things. I'm wrong about baptism <laughs> and go to the nations and get people saved. The Great Commission Network. Yeah, yeah the great, we're Great Commission Baptists. That's what go. it's all about. Right. So I love that about my Baptist brothers, and they, they put, you know, people like me to shame sometimes. Just, we're going to do it. People need Jesus. But because of that, the message of fast, quick, now, urgent mm. results really can resonate in a way. You know, it's the opposite in some yeah. Presbyterian reform circles where they, they may put a higher value on theological education. Yeah. We want to be careful, and they need to, hey... You know, don't be so careful. You're not telling people about Jesus. Mm. And yet, uh, you know, my caution, I guess, a weakness maybe in some Baptist circles is, yeah, it's blitzkrieg evangelism. And it's, here we are, and we mm. work through an interpreter loosely, mm. and 
people may not even be knowing what they're hearing or you know you're you're putting it on a you're showing a movie or something they've never seen a movie before and, right. and it's who is this guy and rage and as you and I have talked many times the dominant religion in the world is is syncretism really mm. yeah and many places in the world put Jesus on top of what you have mm. no problem yeah absolutely I'll take Jesus plus a whole bunch. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'll hedge my bets. He mm. seems like a good guy. So if we don't take the time to really help people know, well, who is the Jesus as a fulfill? You got to start with creation. What is this God like? And what did he predict and prophesy? And what does it mean, Jesus? And say something about the Trinity if we're um, Christians. I know that's hard in the Muslim context. And you got to, yeah. but you can help. You know, I think it was Zane Pratt. I heard it from. He said, contextualization is not to make the gospel more palatable it's to make the gospel more clear yeah it's we want to make sure this makes sense and you're not misunderstanding i think when we move with all haste and speed we are in just almost guaranteeing misunderstandings false conversions mm. nominal christianity churches that aren't really churches they're they're they don't even call themselves churches unregenerate people leading and we have something to write home or to come to the missions conference and say, I planted a thousand churches and I mm. led all these people. But what, what's, what's the fruit to 22 generations later? Amen. Amen. There's a variety of voices kind of in the Reformed world. Some of them get excited, animated about a whole range of things. Um, but there's some... And by some, I'm making a backhanded comment about you. Uh, <laughs> compliment, hopefully. Yeah. Some that are maybe a little bit more careful, and they're just going to go, okay, that's good, but maybe not what we're going for. Why do you think that exists within the Reformed world, speaking specifically about that? Why is there certain leaders that we would all resonate with on a certain level, but we're going to go, how do they get excited about some of these things that we're going to be maybe a little bit more cautionary about when we look at it a little more deeply yeah i mean one of the the biggest dangers i see in my world is that mission is too big hmm. and i've seen this in many different ways I remember like the word is what you're meaning the word is too big okay. yes clarification not that yeah. our heart god's heart for the nations is okay. too big or our but the word and what it encompasses hmm. i've been at conferences that say mission is is one or everything that they, they give the message, sometimes almost explicitly, mission is everything. Mm. So you are going to go dig wells to provide clean water. That's yeah. mission. You're going to go and do a hospital and help repair birth defects in children. That's mission. Uh, you're going to help an agronomist have better crop yields and provide more food for their village. Nice use of agronomist, by the yes, way. Yes, thank you. Okay. That's, that's, that's mission. Now, he, here you ask the question, why does that happen? But let's give the best possible, you know, the, the, the best heart level motivation is, is Christians care about people and yeah. they care about needs in the world. Mm -hmm. And so here's what I'm always up against when I try to give a narrow, narrower definition of mission. I don't want people to hear me saying clean water's bad. Yeah. Medicine's bad. Christians don't care about crops and they don't care if people are starving. No. You know, John Piper's famous line, God, we, you know, we care about all suffering, especially eternal suffering. Amen. But I'll take it one step farther. It's not just, it's easy to, a lot of people would say two wings of the plane, two wings of the bird. You got whatever you call it, humanitarian, social action, social justice, mercy ministry. That's one wing, evangelism, discipleship, church planting. That's another mm. wing. They fly in equal measure. Yeah. I want to be clear. I think you agree with me. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, and when I, why? Uh, it's not that those are bad things. They're good things. And in fact, we should have Christians doing those things. Hmm. I just wouldn't call them mission. Mission, yeah, that English word's not in the Bible, but it means to be sent out. Yeah. So we have someone sent out, presumably across a culture, to speak the name of Jesus. That's what we see. And if Paul is the archetype for mission, just the fact of the matter is in Acts, we, there's a lot of societal needs. Yeah. And he, he'll collect a relief for another church in Jerusalem. And he is caring about... But we don't see him planting trees. We don't see him uh, 
reducing unemployment. We don't see him working against imperial ab abuses in the system. What we see him doing everywhere he goes is speaking the Word of God. Hmm. And the, the, there's a difference between are we called to be avatars of Christ or ambassadors of Christ? Uh, so an avatar is I represent Christ in the world. I show Christ. I show the love of Christ. A lot of people have in their mind, mission is I'm an avatar of Christ. Hmm. When the language in the Bible is, I'm an ambassador. An ambassador comes from another place on behalf of another king or kingdom and has a message. They're, they're announcing something. So by all means, you know, we had a member in our last church. He was a geologist, and he would go every year and to Africa, and he'd go with a Christian team, and they'd dig wells, and we'd pray for him, and we'd say, we love it. Yeah. Bless you. May more of you. But to his credit, he didn't, he didn't ask to be on the missions budget. He didn't you know, claim to be a missionary. He was a geologist who was showing the love of Christ as a mm. geologist. Yeah. So let's do that. Yeah. But there is an important reason for reserving missions and missionaries for those who are sent from one place to another where the gospel is not known or is underserved, that the church might be planted, built up, and strengthened. Mm. Yeah, excellent. There's a book about that. Greg Gilbert had a part in Greg that. Gilbert, yeah. mainly, okay. mainly. All the good chapters are from Greg Gilbert. <laughs> what is the mission of the church? Yeah, and Excellent. if somebody wants to find, I mean, I've if you Google Kevin DeYoung, Mission of the Church, I wrote for yeah. Gospel Coalition, uh, you know, a shortish article on what yeah. is the mission of the church. So if you just want to kind of get the overview in 10 minutes, there's a lot of stuff out there. Excellent. Thanks. Why is urgency and speed, as good as it is, why is that so popular in this day and age, 2021, like we look back at Adoniram Judson, we look back at John Payton, we look back at Amy Carmichael, that wasn't really an animating factor. But today, those seem to be really high on the list of kind of missionary goals or strengths. Why is that the case? Part of it is our impatience. Okay. We're used to, and in, in, I'm speaking as an American, we're used to getting things done, doing things our way, uh, but let's let's not put the worst motives. There's yeah. just a desire for the need is so great, yeah. and people are perishing every single day. They can't they can't wait. And the famous line: "It's only good news if it gets there on time." Mm. So we better get it there mm. on time. So again, the the answer is not to so drag our feet and be so cautious we never take risks for Jesus. Yeah. But here's the caution against the mantra of speed, urgency, now, you got to go. That tends to, it, it tends, it can tend to send out people who are not trained well, yeah. and it can tend to send out people who don't stay well. Mm. And those two things go together. And it can lead to results that don't last well because they're, they're, it's all about speed. So if my goal is I got to get there as fast as I can, I got to plant as fast as I can, and I got to move on to the next place as fast as I can, then all along the way you can be tempted to take shortcuts. Mm. You can be impatient when you get there. And sometimes it's our it's our sending churches back home who they want they want numbers they want to know how many people and what are we spending all this money for. Mm. Famously, Samuel Zwaymer comes from my neck of the woods in Western Michigan, uh, apostle to Islam, and then taught at Princeton. Uh, and commend his his writings to you. But you know he estimated you know his number of conversions were maybe in the dozens. I mean he just mm. didn't. You don't always see the fruit that you would like to see, no matter your faithfulness. Sometimes, by God's grace, you translate, and a whole people group, you know, have a church, and mm. what you, were, you know, the Lord is able to do through you and your family and through others. But sometimes it's faithfully, like Paul, God tells him, "Stay in Corinth because I have many people there." Um, God's sovereignty was the motivation to stay, even when Paul didn't seem to be seeing the fruit that he mm. wanted to see. Hmm. Uh, have you heard of church planting movements, four fields, disciple making? Have you heard of that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just wherever you want to go with that. Thoughts on church planting movements, four fields, DMM, CPM, what they're known for, T for T sometimes, that whole kind of genre of church planting today. Yeah. 
So you're more the expert on it than, than I am and commend the stuff that you've written and, and others have written on it. But uh, again, so here's the good impulse yeah. uh, movements, disciple making movements, church planting movements. The good impulse is we want to go, we want to share Jesus, we, want to, we don't want to put up unnecessary obstacles, cultural obstacles. We want people to come to know Christ and we want them to lead others to Christ. Okay, who yeah. could disagree with that? Yeah. The devil's in the details or the lack of details sometimes. <laughs> right. So the, 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 the danger that I see with these movements, first of all, the, the word there, words matter. Why movement? Why not church? Mm. Uh, now, maybe that should say, well, people in, in, in where we're going don't want the word church. Okay, I, I can understand that. But a movement... Is something different than a church, and I think in this case it's deliberate in calling it, mm. you know, a, a movement, a Jesus movement. So when you say church, in some people's mind, that sounds like, oh, okay, now we got to slow down, we got to have elders, and yeah, is this going to be Western? What do we have to do with this thing called church? Mm. And we, how, where do we get the stained glass windows from, and all of that? But that's not what we mean by church, not all of that. We mean the, the elders, we mean the order, we mean the training, we mean discipling people so that in these movements sometimes you, you go and you find someone who's open to just reading the Bible with you and you read the Bible and they seem interested in Jesus. You know, most people in the world are very spiritual, and religious, not spiritual in the Holy Spirit, but mm. most people in the world in fact, most other religious traditions think very highly of Jesus. Mm. Muslims do. Hindus do. It's not a hard thing to say, here's this guy, Jesus. Do you like Jesus? Would you want to pray a prayer to this Jesus? Mm. Would you want to pray a prayer for this Jesus to, to help you? Do you want to try to follow the instructions of this Jesus? Actually, a lot of people in the world are going to say yes to that. Yep. But does that mean that they've been born again by the Spirit of God, that they really understand the cross and human sinfulness? And it's not that they have to you know, be able to pass an RTS systematic theology class in order to become a Christian. Yeah. But in order to become a Christian, you need to know something of the Christian story. And so my fear is in these movements, you have false conversions, and then you have in turn these people who maybe aren't really born again, aren't really Christians, who are then leading others, mm. and they're reading the Bible, and, and, it, and it can gravitate toward an obedience, performance, faith, because frankly, that's how religions work in yep. the world. That's what makes sense. So to get this am amazing concept of God's unilateral sovereign grace breaking in, and it's really how he changes my heart and what I mm. believe, and out of that I obey, rather than well, let's read the Bible together and let's try to do what this book tells us to do. Mm. Uh, I, boy, I hope I'm not putting too harsh a point on it, but I, I have to imagine that in many cases, the devil rejoices with that kind of mm. mission work. People think they're Christians, but they're not. They don't fully understand the cross. Mm. They spread this to others all the while. Western money pours in and supports it, and people platform it as if it's doing great. I mean, what better mechanism there could, could there be to frustrate true gospel work in the world? Yeah, no, it's very true. It's heartbreaking in many ways because then you have people who have been inoculated almost that's right. to the true gospel. I mean, it's so much They harder. think they know it. Yeah, yeah. and that's... And, and you, you've had, you have more experience than I do. I mean, I've traveled to different places and talked to indigenous Christians mm. who say th this stuff coming from America is really detrimental. These yeah. people, they, you know, because a lot of them have given up so much to be in the church or to be identified as a Christian. Yeah. Here's where I say why it happens. I think a lot of it is our fear of suffering and not just for us, but we don't have a theology of suffering to lead others that, and I get it. If, if, if I'm coming from a place and I feel like I'm living pretty comfortable Christian life, how can I call these people to suffer, to yeah. be baptized, to be, join a church, to leave behind their Muslim identity mm. and be a Christian? That's a huge cost. They, they may be disowned by their family or worse. Yeah. And so 
I think that impulse in us is to say, let's make this easier. I don't know. That's, that's maybe too much. Yeah. Can we really ask that of them? So let's let them stay in their mosque. They'll, in their heart, they'll be praying to Jesus. They mm. can still keep all the Muslim pillars and all the festivals, but they'll read their Bible mm. and we'll call that a commitment to Christ. Yeah. No, those are heartbreaking things. Yeah. That, yeah, unfortunately, that's coming from our neck of the woods. It is. I want to say. It is.